Brother Bishop, come on up here with me. And uh, I thought we would take advantage of this young man. And uh, first of all, and normally we give people time to ask our missionaries questions. We did not do that this morning. I could say it's because he took too much time, but that's not really true. Uh, and the setting just wasn't there. But this afternoon, the setting is. And personally, I want him to talk a little more about the Philippines. Uh, when he said, how many islands? 7,132. So, uh, I think that needs some explaining. <laughs> Explain it to us, Explain it. As, uh, uh, as the hillbilly would say. Uh, and also, I would like for him to talk about uh, the Muslims and their faith a little more. Because uh, you know we have them here in town. And you may have the opportunity to witness to one one day. So I really thought uh, that uh, we ought to have a little time to just visit and allow you to ask questions and talk and get, get him to talk a little more about his field and the people that he is going to. You'll have me from now on with Romans. So um, uh, I thought we would take this time. Is that all right with you all? Yeah. Great, because I'm going to do it anyway. Brother Hunt said I could do it this way. Yeah, amen. So, all right. First of all, talk a little bit about the land, the Philippines, uh, Asia, which nobody realizes that's part of Asia. Uh, and so talk about that a little bit. And, and y'all think of some questions you want to ask him. And then also about uh, uh, some more about the Muslims and how, how we deal with them. They are here. Okay, sure. All right. All right. Well, the Philippines. Well, uh, of course, the Philippines was was you know during World War II. Uh, we uh, the the America actually acquired the Philippines at the end of this what was known as the Spanish American War, and uh, of course it was a Spanish colony for over 300 years. Uh, Magellan is accredited with discovering the Philippines, but according to the studies I've done, Muslims landed there probably three to four hundred years before he, he made it to the Philippines. And uh, so you could say that the Muslims actually, you know, were the first, I, I, I guess you might say that they were the first outsiders to reach the Philippines. And uh, that, of course, they introduced Islam to the southern part of the Philippines. And uh, uh, let's see, uh, Manila is the capital city of the Philippines. It's in the far north on an island called Luzon. Uh, Luzon is actually the largest island, and uh, uh, that's where a lot of the uh, uh, at the end of World War II, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of battles took place there on Luzon. Mindanao was actually spared a lot. Uh, there wasn't a lot of conflict that actually happened in Mindanao because of where the American forces decided to land, which was Leyte uh, in Leyte Gulf, and so Mindanao they. they they pretty much bypassed the island of Mindanao when they when they invaded the Philippines when MacArthur made his famous return, I will return. And of course they did. And uh, uh, the end of the war ended in a, a place called Corregidor. That's where the Japanese made the last stand. I've not been there, but I, I, I'm told it's worth seeing just to go to the island and see all the you know the gun emplacements that are still there. And, and so uh, we did get to go to Bataan. In 2009, my family and I took our first trip to the Philippines. Uh, Kelsey was nine, I believe, and Heath was four. And uh, we, we had an opportunity. Um, and that's how we got introduced to the Philippines, really, was in 2009. We had a Filipino pastor who came to our church in Denton, Texas. And uh, he, he has a church on, on uh, near about two and a half hours south of Manila in a place called Batangas. And he has a Christian school, a rather, rather large Christian school there and uh, Bible college and so he comes to the states to try and raise money to help support his Bible college there in his Christian school. Uh, the church is self-supporting there but he tries to raise money to help finance his school and, and his uh, the Bible college there and his name is Ephraim Camacho and we met him for the first time in 2009 and, and it was odd how it happened. Um, uh, after church services, a uh, pastor took him out to eat, was going to take him out to eat, and he asked us, did we want to come along? Because he, he knew we had a heart for missions, and of course I said, sure, we'd love to. And, and we, we went out to eat, and it was during that, the process of that 
eating out that uh, Pastor Camacho asked my pastor if he would come and preach the missions conference, which was the next year. It, it would have been in February of 2009. And uh, my pastor agreed. And he turned to me and asked me, he said, would you like to go? And I said, well, sure I would. I, I really didn't know how we were going to get there, to be honest with you. Um, we didn't have the money ourselves to get there. And uh, but the Lord made it possible for us to to uh, buy plane tickets. And, and so we got to go in 2009. And that was on Luzon. That wasn't on Mindanao. Uh, it, it was actually, when we were there, we actually met some people from Mindanao, though. And uh, uh, to be honest with you, I didn't know much about Mindanao. I, I probably didn't know a lot about Luzon. If somebody was to ask me about the Philippines, I probably would have said, well, I think that's where Manila is. You know, I had a kind of a vague. And I remember, uh, uh, you know, I'm a big uh, history buff, so I like studying history, World War II history. And so, so I remember studying about Bataan and, you know, the Bataan Death March and some things. And, and so those, those, those are some things I probably would have known. And uh, so we were able to go, and we actually met some people from Mindanao. And I asked uh, Pastor Camacho, uh, you know, about Mindanao. And, and really, truly, all he said at that time, and he just said, Brother, he said, just don't go down there. He said, it wouldn't be safe for you there. It's just best not to go down there. And so I just kind of, well, okay, I don't want to go down there then. And uh, so that was pretty much the end of it at that time. But the Lord didn't start to work on our heart about the Philippines. And... Uh, to be honest with you, if you ever meet the Filipino people, if you ever go to the Philippines, uh, you'll, you can't help but fall in love with the people. Uh, they're just that kind of people. Uh, very hospitable, as I said this morning. You know, it, it, it's their culture, and, and um, they take that very serious. Uh, they, 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 they want to be hospitable. And at that time, uh, America was still revered to a degree. Things are kind of waning a little bit now. Uh, with the new president, uh, uh, I believe his name is Ronaldo D uh, Duterte, and he has a little bit of an anti-American streak running through him. You, you can just listen to him talk, and, and you can just tell he, you know, he's not what we would consider, a, a, you know, a, a Filipino president, and and he's kind of warmed up to China a little bit and some things. So I'm not sure how how that's going, what direction that's going to ultimately go in. But the Lord knows, and and uh, uh, but we did get to go in 2009, and we were introduced to the Philippines, and um, uh, Mindanao, you know, and I said earlier this morning that Mindanao is a lot different than Luzon, and it is, you know, of course geographically, but it's just the makeup of the island is different. It's a lot more mountains, a lot more jungle there. Um, so there are some differences, and the culture is different. I, you know, you, you might consider consider Mindanao more of a, for lack of better words, more of like hillbillies, really. You know, the way, the way we see people here, you know, that live out in the country. And and uh, so that's, that's kind of the way I guess they're viewed by people from the north, you know. Um, I have a good friend of mine that pastors out in California now. He, he's from the Philippines. He was born on Cebu Island, which is just north of Mindanao. And... Uh, his father worked for a mining company, so he lived several years on Mindanao when he was a boy. And he grew up in the southern part of the Philippines. And uh, in, in the southern part of the Philippines, at least on Mindanao, their, their primary dialect is something called Visayan. Their national language is called Tagalog. Tagalog. That's what their national language is. We would call it their trade language. Um, but Visayan is primarily spoken in the south, in the southern part of the Philippines. And uh, he, he, he really didn't like to go to the northern part of the Philippines because he told me, he said they knew I was from the south and they would treat me differently. When, when I would talk, they could tell I was from the southern part of the Philippines. And he said, I just didn't like going to the north. He said, I, I just didn't like it. And so, you know, maybe they'd be on this hillbillies, you know. And uh, uh, so... Um, let's see, where, where was I going with my thought? Um, anyway, uh, the Philippines, uh, Mindanao is considered the breadbasket of the Philippines. Without Mindanao, the Philippines could not, could not exist, it, as far as I'm talking about, like, agricultural. Uh, the, the vast majority of their produce comes from Mindanao. That's where most of the rice is grown. That's where the most of their produce comes from, is Mindanao. 
And so it's considered the breadbasket of the Philippines. And uh, whoever controls Mindanao really controls the Philippines. And so the Muslims understand that. And uh, they, they actually call Mindanao, their, uh, they, they call it their more land. They, they, they consider it theirs, that it belongs to them. And, and I guess just from a, a secular standpoint, you could probably say, yeah, I understand why you say that. You were there. Uh, you know, you've been there a long time. And uh, uh, I, I can't remember exactly when it was, but and of course it stirred up a lot of problems. Uh, the, uh, the Philippines as a whole, as I stated earlier, is, is primarily Catholic. And at one point the, the Philippine government began to uh, move settlers from the north down into Mindanao, Catholic settlers. And of course that caused, a, that, that caused some problems and, and there was a lot of, a lot of conflict uh, at one point, and, and there still is conflict there, but, but at one point it, it was just really raging because, of course, the Muslims said, this, this belongs to us. This, this is ours. You know, and here you're moving these people in and you're forcing them upon us. And so you can understand how they would butt heads. And uh, uh, so, you know, both the Philippine government and the Muslims understand the need to control that island, the, the island of Mindanao. Uh, just, just a little bit of history for you. I don't know how many of you are history buffs. How, how many of you are familiar with the 1911-45? The 1911-45. It's, it's, it's the government issue. 1911. Did you know that that gun was specifically designed because of the Muslims on Mindanao? After the Spanish-American War, we assumed control of that country. And... At that time, the, the military issued 38s, 38 revolvers, to their officers. And, of course, we got into it with the Muslims there, just like the Spanish did. As a matter of fact, the Spanish never conquered Mindanao. They, were, they, they conquered all the other Philippines, but Mindanao was the island that, that they simply could not conquer because of the Muslim presence there. And uh, so, uh, you know, we, we faced the same... Uh, of the same issues that they faced. And uh, so the, 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 the story goes that, that you know, the military would be there and these Muslims would, would hype, up on, hype up on drugs and they would come charging. I mean, you know, these, these, these guys were fierce, you know, charging with swords and, and they'd shoot them over and over again with 38 and they would still keep coming. So that's why the 45 was developed. That's that, if you do the history on the 45, that, that's the reason that they developed that, that particular handgun was for that purpose. And I, and I find that interesting. It just kind of gives you an idea about who they were, you know, how, how fierce they were and how determined they were. And to be honest with you, there's, there's still some there that hold to that, to that type of determination. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and no matter what a Muslim tells you, the ultimate goal of Islam is, to, is for the world to be Islamic. That's their ultimate goal, is for the world to be either be converted into Islam or have or have people subdued. Because there's a lot of misconceptions about Islam. The word Islam does not mean peace. That's not the historical meaning of the word. The word Islam actually means submission. Submission. Now, Muslims today would have you to believe that it means peace, but it does not. If you look up the historical uh, definition of Islam, you will find it means submission. That, that's the meaning of the word Islam, is submission. And uh, so, but they're very determined. Uh, and, 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 you know, you, 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 you'll meet Muslims who, who are very kind, kind, uh, in this country. You know, you'll, you, you'll meet Muslims who, who, who are kind and and by the way, you know, most, most Muslims you meet, most Muslims you meet are not an Osama bin Laden type. You know, they're, 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 they're not. But the way I think about those types of Muslims is they're, they're really Muslim in name only. They're, they're, they're only Muslim in name only. They're, they don't practice histo historical Islam. If they practice the way it was meant to be practiced, they would be an Osama bin Laden type of Muslim. That's 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 what Islam is, and uh, as as Muhammad 
uh, as Muhammad progressed in age and as his revelations progressed, and by the way, I do believe he received revelations. I do believe he did. Now, he said he received them from the angel Gabriel. He received them from an angel, all right. I, I personally believe that. But it was not a godly angel. Let's just say that. And uh, as, his, as, as he progressed, his revelations became, became more and more aggressive, more and more violent. And uh, uh, in the beginning, he was pretty, pretty subdued. Uh, and then his first wife died that, that he loved and was married to for several years. She died. And, and, and at that point, he began to have to improvise to, to, to stay alive because she, she, she pretty much financed him. She was a wealthy widow, and, and so she, she financed him. And, and uh, it was during that time that he was married to her, or I'm, I'm sorry, yes, during, during that time that he was married, he went to uh, Mecca, and he made trips with his uncle, or no, this was before he was married to her. He, he, he made trips into, business trips into Mecca with his uncle, and it was during one of these business trips that he actually came in contact with a, a Nestorian priest. And but what I understand, the Nestorians were an, an apostate group of Christian Christianity that were apostate Christians, or, or apostate Christianity. Uh, they denied the deity of Christ and, and, and some things. And he came in contact with, with a Nestorian priest, and uh, it was this priest who had confirmed that, that, that he was a prophet. And of all things, and it sounds strange, but this priest, uh, Muhammad had a hairy mole between his shoulders, and this priest said, that's a stamp of your prophethood of all things. I mean, that's just, I mean, to me, that's just weird that that, that, that would be your, your the stamp of your prophethood would be a hairy mole of all things. And, and, of course, we don't find that any prophet of God was identified that way. You know, we, we just don't find it. We, we just don't find it. But anyway, that's that's how he how his to, in his mind how he was confirmed a prophet, and uh, so you can understand where a lot of his theology came from. Uh, you know, he, he was in contact with with, with with this apostate Christian group. His wife had come in contact with an apostate Christian group, so he really got had it on both ends as far as his doctrine, his theology. Uh, his mother dabbled in in the occult. Uh, she would oftentimes uh, 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 supposedly speak to what uh, what they call jinns. We, we would call them genies. She, she, she would oftentimes say that she spoke with genies, spirits. And so you can understand how he was messed up in his thinking. I mean, growing up like that, and, and then you come in contact with this apostate Christian group, and, and you get all this, this, this uh, uh, tainted theology. And so you can understand where some of his thinking comes from. Because he, he, he denied the deity of Christ. He, he outwardly denied the claim that Christ was deity. And, and of course you can understand where that would come from. Um, let's see. Dealing with Muslims. Uh, one thing you don't want to ever do when, when you meet a Muslim, you don't want to bring up the fact that Muhammad was a pedophile. I don't know if y'all if y'all if y'all read some of the history of Muhammad. He consummated marriage with a nine-year-old girl. Okay, he was a pedophile. He, he was a pedophile. But if you bring that up, you're you're it's not going to serve your purpose at all. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to make them angry, and and your conversation is probably going to end at that point. Uh, you you don't want to mention. Uh, uh, you, you uh, don't want to talk about, uh, uh, in Mecca they have something called the Kaaba, and uh, it, you know, of course I haven't been there, it's, it, by the way it's against uh, 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 Islamic law for our Christians to step foot in Mecca. They consider that their most holy place. And of all things they claim to have freedom of religion, but you can't go there. It's off limits to you as an infidel, you cannot step foot in Mecca. They, they will not allow you there. So they don't practice freedom of religion the way that they say they do. Okay? Uh, uh, Islam will say, well, we, we believe that all faiths have the, have the right to coexist. And they do, but under certain restrictions. Uh, under certain restrictions. But uh, going, back to, going back to the Kaaba, uh, 
Don't ask me why. Uh, at one time, uh, uh, the uh, Muhammad's ancestors were 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 uh, uh, a polytheist. They worshipped many gods, and and of course uh, Muhammad. Was 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 anti polytheistic. A, a lot of Christians say that that, that that Islam is a polytheistic religion, but it's really not. Uh, at least not from from their standpoint, because they believe there's one God, one Creator, one God. And uh, but for some reason, when Muhammad went in to Mecca and to the Kaaba, he he eliminated all of the false gods that were there. They had gods of stone and gold and wood and, and inside this Kaaba, this building, the structure. But he left one thing. He left something called the Kaaba stone. I, I've heard that it's a it's actually a meteorite. That's, that's what I've been told. It's, it's a meteorite. It's black. And they kiss this thing and they worship this Kaaba stone. And so my so I'm thinking, why on earth would he leave that there? You know to to have people to worship the thing, because because Mo, because Moses ran in uh, the, the same problem ran in uh, was ran into with the bronze serpent. It had to be destroyed because the, ch uh, the children of Israel were, were worshiping the thing, and so it eventually had to be destroyed. And so why he did that, I, I, I don't have a clue to be honest with you. I, I just know that it's there and uh, it, it, it's sacred to Muslims. Uh, the Kaaba is, is their most, or the uh, Mecca and the Kaaba is, is their most sacred uh, place, their most holy place. And, and every Muslim, at least once in their life, if they're physically able to, are required to make a pilgrimage to Mecca and go through the, the, the religious rites that they do there. And, uh, uh, but, but going back to Muhammad, you know, you... You won't make any ground by, by mentioning the fact that he was a pedophile, that, that they will get angry. You won't make any ground talking about the cobblestone, asking them why they kiss the thing and, and worship the thing, because you're just going to make them angry, even, even though it's real, even though they do it. Um, uh, it it's kind of like I've witnessed to uh, talk to Catholics before. And if you ask them, do, do you pray to Mary? Their answer will be, oh, no, no, we don't know. We don't pray to Mary, but they do that they do pray to her. They believe they get to Christ through her. So yes, they do pray to her. And so, uh, you know, uh, and most of the time, it, it, you know, when, when you're talking to a Catholic, if you're smart, you won't bring that up in the beginning because you're just going to make them angry and you're just going to close the door on being able to witness to them is what's going to happen. And, and it's the same thing with Muslims. You know, uh, uh, we can be very uh, uh, strong-willed if we want to, but if we're going to win them, then then we have to be able to to uh, not just not just debate with them. Because here's the thing about a debate: most of the time, when you debate someone, you're going to walk away thinking, "I won the debate," and and that's probably what's going to happen. And they're not going to change your mind, and you're not going to change their mind by trying to argue with them, debate with them. What you have to get them to understand, and what they will say is that is that the Quran is actually is actually a, for lack of better words, it's an extension of the Bible. That's what a Muslim believes. But we, we but you have to get them to understand that the two books are not the same. They're completely different. As a matter of fact, if you were to read the Quran, you would find that the Quran tells us that one of Noah's sons died in the flood. That Noah called out to his son, come back, come back, and the son, I'll be okay. And he drowned in the flood. Well, the biblical account is completely different. You'll find that when Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, was dumb, you'll find the Quran says he was dumb for nine days. Well, the Bible tells us that he was dumb up until the time John was born. The two can't be true. I mean, they're, they're, and that's just a couple of, of clear-cut examples of how the two are completely different. And some people claim that Muhammad plagiarized the Bible, and I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily disagree with that. But he added his own slant to it. He took the Bible and he added his slant to it. And, uh, you know, uh, 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 
Another thing to understand is that Muhammad did not write the Quran. As a matter of fact, it was the, the actual Quran was not written until after he was dead. It, the, the Quran was not written until after the death of Muhammad. And the reason the Quran was written was because Muhammad's uh, 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 the, the group he had, his, his inner circle began to die off. And so they realized, hey, we got to do something. we got to write this down before it's lost in antiquity. And, you know, that, that just strikes me as odd because it, most of it was put to memory. Most of it was put to memory of men. Some of it was written down on bone, on rock, on leaves, excuse me, on whatever they had because they didn't have a parchment. So they wrote it down on whatever they could, the things that they could write down. But a lot of it was, was put to memory. So, uh, to me, that's a problem with the Quran. It, is it a lot of it? A lot of it how, a Muslim will make the claim, well, you can't trust the Bible because it's been corrupted. But at the same time, did you know that, that the same manuscripts that were used to translate this Bible were in existence during Muhammad's time. The same exact manuscripts, the, the, the same majority text, the Hebrew Masoretic and the Greek New Testament text, called a majority text, was in, was existed in the same form as it did in Muhammad's day. So for them to look, for them to lay claim that the Bible has been corrupted is simply not true. But but that's 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 what they will say, and it makes it very difficult to witness to them. Because they'll, because they'll say, well, yeah, I, I, I believe that the Bible is the Word of God, but, but I believe that men have corrupted it. Here's the problem with that. If that is true, and there again, you've got to be careful how you use things when you're talking to a Muslim. Because things, some, some things are very, are, are very uh, uh, inflammatory. And you can cause a, a, you know, a flare-up, and, and then you've lost the ability to witness to them. Did you know that the Quran guarantees the preservation of the Bible? Did you know that? Muhammad guaranteed that Allah would preserve his word, the Bible. So if this has been corrupted, then that means that the Quran is not true. It can't be true. But if you bring that up to a Muslim, you're going to start an argument as to what's going to happen. And what I'm trying to do is, is just give you some basic thoughts on, on what, why they think what they think. You know, what, why a Muslim is a Muslim and, 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 and you know, kind of what their theology is. Um, let's see. When, when you're talking to a Muslim, the ultimate goal is to get them to admit that there is a difference between the Quran and the Bible. That the two are not the same. That, that, that the two are not the same, and, and part of the problem with doing that, Muslims have a have a. They really have a loophole, and and uh, it can be frustrating trying to talk to them because of this loophole. And basically, what they say, and it, it, it's very convenient, and, and it's really smart on their part if you stop and think about it. But what they say is that is that latter revelation always supersedes earlier revelation. Even in the Quran, even in the Quran, when 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 the Quran seems to contradict itself, what the Muslim will say is, "Oh, Allah sent a, a, a better revelation in place of what He sent prior to that." So you can understand how it would be frustrating trying to talk to a Muslim with. And most, if if a Muslim has has any is as any at all informed about Islam, then they're going to know about that. And and it's it, it can really be frustrating because you can get into just a back and forth, and you're not going to really go anywhere. But ultimately, the goal is to get them to to understand first and foremost. That the Bible and the Quran are not the same, and that they cannot be the same. It's impossible for them to be the same. And then the next, and, and then the next thing to get the, 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 that you have to get them to understand is that is that it is their sin 
that separates them from God. Earlier this morning, I talked about how a Muslim doesn't believe that their sin is the problem. They believe that it's their lack of good works that's the problem. They believe that Allah requires them to, to, to do good. And I think we'll all agree that, that Christianity, we should all be good people. All of us should be. If we're not, then we're really a bad testimony for Christ. I, and I think everybody would agree with that. That if, if, if we are dishonest in our business dealings, if, 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 if we don't uh, mind lying about people as, as believers, then that's a bad testimony toward the Lord Jesus Christ. That sheds a bad light on Christianity. Well, a Muslim believes that that's what's ultimately going to either send them to heaven or send them to hell. Is that it's either I've done enough good things to outweigh my bad or I haven't done enough good things to outweigh my bad. Um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, when, when, when you're talking to a Muslim, one thing they'll say, one thing they'll try and get you to, to, to uh, a say or, or get you to agree with is that Muhammad is found in the Word of God. Okay? And as a matter of fact, uh, Muhammad claimed to be found in the Bible. So that's why they're so adamant about it, is that, is that Muhammad laid claim that he is found in the Bible. Uh, one example of, of how, what a Muslim claim, or where a Muslim claims that Muhammad would be found in the Bible would be like uh, Deuteronomy 18, uh, beginning in verse number 15. And Moses, uh, the Lord says this, The Lord thy God will raise up, will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thy, from the midst of thee of thy brethren, like unto me, this is Moses speaking. Unto him shall ye hearken. Well, the Muslim will say, well, that that's Muhammad. That God was going to raise up a prophet like Moses, and, and, and a Muslim would would say that that's Muhammad. That's talking that that, that is that is an example of, of Muhammad found in the scriptures, and. Uh, Really and truly what they're doing there, they're doing something called eisegesis is what they're doing. They're taking the script, scripture completely out of context and, and, and they're putting it, and, and basically they're, they're taking their opinion and applying it to scripture because, and we, we won't read all this, but if you'll, if you'll turn to the last chapter of Deuteronomy chapter number 34, this is what uh, going back to chapter 18, verse number 10 says this, And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, and here it is, whom the, Lord, whom the Lord knew face to face. A Muslim will claim that it's impossible to know God. No man can know God. The Bible tells us that, that Moses knew God face to face. Now I understand that, that Moses never saw God in all of his glory. But did you know that God conversed with Moses? Mm -hmm. He did. If we believe the word of God, Moses had conversations with God. <clears throat> Muhammad said, you can't do that. So how could Muhammad be that prophet? Now what a Muslim will say is, well, what it means by like unto Moses is that Moses was, was, was natural born and Muhammad was natural born. And they'll make comparisons like that claiming that that's how they prove that the two are the same. That Muhammad was like Moses is that, is that both Muhammad and Moses had, you know, had a mother. They were natural born. They had an earthly father. But here's the problem with that. Did you know that Muhammad never worked a miracle? Never performed a miracle? Never did. We don't have any historical record of Muhammad performing a miracle. We know that Moses did. We know he did. We know that God used him to part the Red Sea. We know that. The ten plagues of Egypt. And on and on it goes. Muhammad, we don't have any historical record of Muhammad uh, 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 performing a miracle. None at all. None at all. But they'll make silly claims like, well, they were both born naturally. And, and, and just things like that. But, but when you put it to the test, they, the two cannot be the same. 
Another example that, that they might try and use, that they might try and use to get you to, you know, be, their, their ultimate goal is, is to get you to come over to where they believe. And your ultimate goal is to get them to come over to what you believe. I mean, that, that's, that's, that, that's really what you're trying to do. Now, for a Muslim, and, 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 and maybe I'll reiterate something. The Muslim is not concerned what happens to you. They are not concerned what happens to you. I'm talking about eternally speaking. They are not concerned what happens to you. And, and of course, we know that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. We're supposed to be concerned about others. We're supposed to be concerned about the eternal destiny of others. Let's see. Let, let me go to... Let's look at... Um, oh, let me go here. Okay. If you were to turn to John chapter number 4... Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. John chapter number 1. And we see, the, we see the record of the Pharisees coming to John the Baptist, questioning John the Baptist. Beginning in verse number 19, and this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Well, what a Muslim will say is, Well, that prophet's Muhammad. That's talking about Muhammad, is what that's talking about. But if you go over to John chapter number 6, now this was after Jesus fed the 5,000. Okay? By the way, remember. Jesus and Moses are, are closely related. Okay? And they both, of course, we know that Christ was God's, was, was the Son of God, God the Son. Had a relationship with the Father. Well, Moses had a relationship with the Father. And of course, Moses uh, performed miracles and Jesus performed miracles. This was after Jesus fed the 5,000. Therefore, they gathered... Uh, they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. You see, the problem was the, the Pharisees and... <clears throat> The scribes and the Pharisees had a misunderstanding of who Christ was. That's the whole problem. And they just they, they, they just made the statement right here of a truth. Uh, this is of a truth, that prophet. So when they asked John, are you that prophet? He said no. Because he was not that prophet. But who was that prophet? His Lord Jesus Christ. But, but that's what a Muslim will try to do is they'll try and confuse the subject. And, but if you know the Scriptures well enough, then you can show them, no, that, that's not what that says. And sometimes you've got to read on in through Scripture. You know, when, when Christ told his, told his disciples that He was going to send the Comforter, a Muslim will say, well, that's Muhammad. The Comforter's talking about Muhammad. Well, no, if you read on down through there, you find out real quick that the Comforter is the Holy Spirit. That's who he's talking about. He's not talking about a man. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. But a Muslim will say, well, the comforter's Muhammad. No, let's read on down through. And we'll find out who the comforter is. So what they do, they do something called proof texting. They'll take a text, and they'll take it out of context, and they'll try and use it to prove their side, to, 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 to prove their case. And really and truly, all you have to have is a general working knowledge of Scripture to disprove what they're saying. Now they might try and use the, you know, the the uh, the idea. Well, but it's been corrupted. Then why are you why are you quoting it then? That would be my answer to them. Why are you quoting it if it's been corrupted? 
Why even bother? Because even Muhammad told his people that if they had questions about God, that they were, they were to consult the people of the book. Well, guess who that was? That was Christians. How do they answer that? They can't. Because, because what basically what Muhammad was saying, look, look, if you have questions about God, go to the people of the book. Go to Christians and ask them. Well, the same manuscripts that, 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 that was in existence during Muhammad's day, there again were the same exact manuscripts that the translators used to translate the King James Version of the Bible. Exact same manuscripts. No different. But they'll try and get you to believe that they've been corrupted. And they'll try and get you to say, well, yeah, you know, and, and I, I understand that the Bible's the Word of God, but we have a better revelation now. And that's really not much different than what some of the other, other cults do. There's a very popular cult that will mail you a King James Bible. Did you know that? And they'll also mail you something else that they claim is a more perfect revelation of God. Some of you may know who I'm talking about. Now they, they call themselves Latter-day Saints. They'll mail you a King James Bible, but then they'll also mail you another book, along a companion book, that it better explains the Word of God, is, is what they say. But really, truly, it's, it's, it, 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 it's apostasy. It's apostasy. And, but you can understand how they can do that, and, and people will say, oh, well, yeah, Muslim believes that, that the Bible is the Word of God, well, no, not really. They believe they, they say it's been corrupted, and if it's been corrupted, it's not the Word of God. It can't be the Word of God. Impossible to be the Word of God. So, uh, but what you're trying to get them to do, ultimately, your ultimate goal is to get them to understand that it's their sin that separates them from God. It's not about their good works or their bad works. It's not about that. It's about their sin. And until they can come to that point, you're, you're, you're really not going to win them. And then, and then, you have to get them to, you have to get them to un, not only understand, but to accept Christ as the Son of God. And that's a big deal to a Muslim. That's a huge deal to a Muslim. Because they don't believe that Christ is the Son of God. As a matter of fact, they, they will plainly say, Allah does not have a son. Allah does not have a son. And did you know that a Muslim views you a trend, uh, what we would call, we, in our beliefs, we are Trinitarian in our beliefs. In, in other words, we, we believe that God is a triune being. Not three gods, but a triune being. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Well, a Muslim will say, well, you're worshiping three different gods. No, we're not. But that's what they will say. You're worshiping three different gods. How can God be three in one? You know what? I can't explain that. I, I, I can tell them it's true, but how do you explain the Trinity of God? It's impossible to explain it. We can't even really understand it. We can't even comprehend it. And that's part of the problem, really, is, is there's no way for, for, a human, for a human being to comprehend the Trinity. We can understand that, that it is, but we can't explain how it is. We can't explain it. And I believe that that's a lot of the problem. It is because they try to apply human thinking, human reasoning to God, and you simply can't do that. You know, we accept this by faith, and faith alone. I accept that in the beginning, God, I accept that by faith. I don't have to prove it. I don't have to prove it. All I have to do is believe it. And so ultimately, ultimately, you're trying to get them to the point where they see Christ for who He really is. <clears throat> they will tell you, oh yes, Christ was a good man. He, he was a great prophet. He's one of the greatest prophets, as a matter of fact. But that's as far as it goes with the Muslim. For them to accept Christ as who He says He is, uh, uh, really, truly, that's a big deal. That's that, that's that's a big deal, and, and uh, but when, when when you're dealing with them, 
the hardest thing is, is, is to be patient in talking to them, to, to be patient. Give them time to tell you what they believe. <clears throat> tell them, look, I, I'll give you an hour to tell me what you believe and why you believe it. And we'll give them time to tell you what they believe. But in turn, you've got to give me an hour to tell you what I believe and why I believe it. And then if they say, because more often than not, they're not going to want to debate you. And so, a lot of times what they might say is, oh, well, I really don't have time. And the best way to answer that is, well, don't you think that God's Word is worth the time? Don't you think that, 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 that we should make time to discuss God's Word? And that puts the onus back on them. That puts the onus back on them. Well, let's... let's I tell you what, I, I, I'll meet you somewhere and, and I'll buy you some coffee or whatever... And we'll just sit down and we'll talk and we'll talk and I'll let you tell me what you believe and then let me tell you what I believe. And, and that's really the best way to do it. That's really the best way to do it. And, and ultimately, you know, ultimately it's, it's going to come down to you're, you're trying to uh, avoid confrontation in the beginning, but ultimately it's going to end with confrontation. I mean, there, you know, it, it's ultimately going to end with Christ. Is, is what's going to happen. Um, uh, there's there's a couple of good books that I would recommend that uh, 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 give give a really uh, 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 what I'm trying to say uh, helpful way to talk to Muslims. One of them is called Winning Muslims to Christ, and it's written by name, a man by the name of Mark Bachman. It, it, it's an easy read. It's not a it's not a you know it's not an academic book by any means. Uh, he, he just gives a, 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 a bird's eye view of how he deals with Muslims, how he how he brings them, you know, to where they to where hopefully they need to be. It's called Winning Muslims to Christ. It's written by a man named Mark Bachman. Uh, another good informational book. You wouldn't want to give this book to a Muslim because you would probably make it really bad. It's called uh, Unveiling Islam. It's written by two former Muslims who were saved, two brothers. Uh, who were saved out of Islam, and they wrote a book called Unveiling Islam. And it's basically just some information about Islam. Uh, just, you know, just some general general type information about Islam, what they believe. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, I read a book one time, and, and the author made a statement that, that Islam is one of the simplest yet most complex religions in the world, you know? And, and so it, it's kind of hard because it's simple at one, at one point, but it's complex in another. And, and so, uh, you know, when, when dealing with a Muslim, all I can say is, is, is try to be patient with them. Because if you were in their shoes, you would probably want someone to do that for you. And uh, you know, I, I was 19 years old, 19 years old before I got saved, and I'd been to church before. I, I, I heard the gospel, but I, you know, I, I wasn't I wasn't willing to accept it. But I, but I'm glad that 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 when that when I was ready, that the Lord had someone ready to help me do it, help me to know how to be saved. And, and so I would encourage you, you know, it's they're they're. They're not easy to deal with. As a matter of fact, they can be very difficult to deal with. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, with, with, with the loophole they have, well, yeah, but I just believe that this is a, a better, a clearer revelation of God's Word. And, and those are just some hurdles, hurdles that you have to try and get over. But, but I would definitely encourage you to get the book called Winning Muslims to Christ. Because you said you had Muslims here. And it, it, it'll definitely give you a better understanding of how to witness to them. Uh, that, that way you have it. And he, he goes through a very, a very easy way. And I say easy way, an easy to understand way. And, and he, he tries to deal with all the aspects of Islam, really, in, in just everyday language. You know, he, he doesn't give a, a complete breakdown of Islam. And to be honest with you, it would take volumes, I guess, to, to, to talk about Islam. And, and what it is. And, you know, one thing he says in his book, and, and I really like this, you don't have to be a scholar in Islam 
to be able to, to be able to witness to Muslims. You, you just have to have some understanding about them, you know, what, kind of what they believe, and and then you know, of course, your 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 main your main tool is this right here. You know, you, you need a good working knowledge of the Bible. You know, that way, whenever they do bring up something like Deuteronomy 18 or John chapter 1, you can bring them to other passages and say, well, that that, that explains that. You know, uh, the comforter, you know, they, if, if, if someone's a new Christian and they talk to a Muslim and, and a Muslim brings up the fact of the comforter, and, and, and let's see, as a matter of fact, that's in John 14, I believe. Um, uh, let's see. And I pray that, and, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that ye may abide, that he may abide with you forever. Well, that right there eliminates Muhammad, because Muhammad's not eternal. But a Muslim will try and use that verse and say, well, the comforter is Muhammad. But if you go on down to verse number 26, it's plainly, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, Okay. Christ plainly states that the Comforter is not a person, not, not a flesh and blood person. He's a person. He's the person of the Holy Spirit. He, he's the third person of the Godhead. He's, he's not a flesh and blood being like we are, like Muhammad was. And, and so, but, but if they're talking to someone who, who, doesn't, who, who doesn't have any kind of working knowledge of the Scripture at all, you, you, can, sell, you can see how it would be confusing. But if you have just a basic working knowledge of Scripture when you're talking to them, you know that that goes, you know that that speaks volumes in, in your favor, and and you know, you know what, you may spend a lot of time talking to them, and you may never see them saved. There's no guarantees. There, there, there's absolutely no guarantees. But you can say that about anybody. You know, there, there, there's no guarantees. But if you at least don't try, if you if you at least don't try to take the time, and uh, you know one thing I found, and you know I, I don't know Stephenville that well, um, but there are certain places where you can find Muslims. There, there are, you know, there, there's there's certain places where you can find them, and uh, you know, um, just try to strike up a friendship with them, and just start talking to them. And, and start asking them questions about who they are, because you know what, we we all like people to to talk to us and, and show interest in us. All of us do, and Muslims are no different, really. They're really no different than we are. And and, and if you start by trying to talk to them and, and and showing a true interest in who they are, then you might be surprised, you know. And then eventually, hopefully. The, the, the end goal is to witness to them and talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ and talk to them about, about the Bible. And so, uh, you know, I would just try and encourage you not to be discouraged when, when, when you're trying to talk to them. You know, uh, don't, don't be discouraged if, if they seem informal or cold in the beginning. Because you because you might be surprised. Eventually, they may warm up to you, and 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 you know it, it's always best to be honest with them. It's always best to be honest with them and let them know that you're a Christian, you know, and and uh, not not to try and go about maybe in what some people might say a deceptive way, you know, where, where, where you don't introduce yourself and and, and you try to you know. Uh, Maybe some people might say it is underhanded. And so I think that 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 the upfront approach is best. You know, just introduce yourself to them, and you might even tell them, "Look, I go to Washington Street Baptist Church." You know, you might even invite them to church. You never know. You, you never know. So you did good. First of all, I'd say he's ready to go. <laughs> Amen. Several thoughts. Number one, don't jump into a snake's nest unless you've got a plan out. Y'all know what I mean by that? See, he studied and studied and studied and studied. 
I don't think God would stick your nose into a snake's den unless he knew you were ready and had a way out. He'd been studying this a long time. Something else I want to mention that he, it, it wasn't in his subject, but he touched on something very important to the, the average American church-going person, Christian or not, and you have both in churches. Were you listening to what he said about Muhammad? He got exposed to this, and so he picked up that little belief. He got exposed to that, so he picked up that little belief. He got exposed to that, so he got picked up that little belief. And after a while, he was a mess. Brother Clyde, I've met a lot of church members just like that. And what I mean is, they get an hour of this tea evangelist, they get an hour of this tea of TV evangelist, and then they get an hour from this guy over here, and they pick up something from that denomination, and a little bit now from that denomination, and before you know it, they're so messed up, nobody can do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Be careful what you expose yourself to. Not everything that is spoken in the name of Christ is from the Bible. Look what a mess Muhammad got himself into. Right, Clyde? So be careful. Thirdly, if you're not a regular spiritual partaker of the Bible, you're not ready to do what he's talking about. You can get your head chopped. The Bereans search the scriptures daily. Well, those things for sure. How often has that man that stands on the pulpit three, four times a week here said to you, as a Christian, you study your Bible daily. Daily. You, you partake of the Word of God every day just like you eat a meal or two every day. And I think one more thing that personally I'm really big on. Get the leadership of the Holy Spirit on who we talk to. Because not only is he going to get you ready, but the person he wants you to talk to is going to get him ready. And then it'll work. Amen? Brother Bishop, thank you. This has turned out to be a class on how to deal with Muslims. But you know what? We, we're surrounded by it. So this was uh, worthy of the time. Yeah. Let me give you one more thing and we're done. The very text that we're now on in, in Romans. I said we're in Romans 12 to the end of the book, which is all application to all the teaching he had done before chapter 12. And the foundation of it all is Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We belong to God. And one of the things we're supposed to do is let our light shine for the Lord Jesus Christ. Call it salt, call it light, call it evangelism. Call it what you will, but we're here as a church collectively, individually, to let our light shine for the Lord Jesus Christ. But then that second verse, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you do that? The Word of God. That you may know the will of God. Christians who stay in their Bible are Christians ready to be used by God in his service. Amen?